Thank you all for being here. Shadi, thank you for welcoming all of us. Yes, hi. Good morning to everyone. Welcome uh, to this panel discussion on the human rights landscape. Uh, 20 years after 9-11, um, it is you know, my distinct pleasure to have our, our distinguished guests with us today in this conversation. Um, I am Shadi Mokhtari. I teach uh, justice, ethics, and human rights and Middle East politics here at the School of International Service at American University. Um, on the logistics side, before we begin, uh, this discussion will last for about 45 minutes, um, and there will be 15 minutes set aside for Q&A at the end there. So if you'd like to ask a question, please submit it through the Q&A function um, at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, and closed captioning is available for those who need it. Please click on the option uh, at the bottom of, of your screens for that. I've also been instructed to, to just uh, ask that no one record the session. Uh, we will be recording the webinar and it is available um, on SIS's YouTube channel. Um, so let me begin by uh, first introducing our, our three panelists. Um, so we have with us Sarah Lee Whitson, uh, the director of DAWN, Democracy for the Arab World Now, which is a newly formed human rights NGO, uh, which has a good bit of focus on kind of the implications of US foreign policy on human rights in, in the Middle East. Uh, but prior to kind of being at the helm of that initiative, she was uh, for many years, from 2004 uh, to 2020, I believe, uh, the director of Human Rights Watch's uh, Middle East program. Uh, Jamil Dekwar uh, is the director of the ACLU's Human Rights Program, uh, where he started uh, in 2004 as well. Uh, previously, he actually worked with Sarah Lee Whitman, uh, Whitson, who I, I just learned <laughs> that they were colleagues um, prior to joining this program, but he was also at the Adala Center, um, which gives him a, a, hum a Middle East link as well. He currently also teaches at Hunter College, Bard College, and John Jay College um, as, as adjunct uh, lecturers there. Nadia Ali is Robert Family Professor of International Studies, Professor of Anthropology and Middle East Studies um, at Brown University. Um, her main research interests revolve around feminist activism uh, and gendered mobilization with a focus on Iraq, uh, Egypt, Lebanon, Turkey, and the Kurdish political movement. Uh, so it's really, truly an honor to have all three of them here. Uh, these are people who I think have been thinking about these dynamics for, for quite some time and, you know, with, with a lot of hands-on um, engagement. Uh, I have been given permission to just speak very briefly um, uh, to try and kind of frame the conversation before we delve in here. Um, and, and part of it is because, as you'll see, you know, I've kind of developed <laughs> this panel um, it, to mirror my own interest in, in, in work. So in 2009, I published After a Grave, where I looked at the impact of, of the response to 9-11, the U.S. response to 9-11 on human rights, both in the Middle East and in the United States, kind of side by side, but then in interactions between the two. Um, and I, I'll tell you what I found in 2001 uh, was going on in terms of the human rights landscape. And we can kind of use that as a springboard for the rest of the conversation today. Um, so in 2001, the flow of international human rights uh, politics generally went in one direction. Human rights mobilizations, initiatives, priorities almost exclusively originated from Western governments, NGOs, and universities. Um, and they almost universally focused on the non-West, including you know, the Middle East. And the human rights discussions largely centered on women's rights, religious freedom, and other violations attributed to kind of backwards religious or cultural traditions, um, and not violations in which you know, Western geopolitics played a role um, uh, or, or the West could otherwise be implicated. Um, 
you know, when the 9-11 attacks happened, this politics, this kind of geography of human rights really set the stage for human rights and women's rights in particular being enlisted to sell the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, at the same time, in the United States in 2011, um, excuse me, 2001, Americans pretty confidently ascribed to the view that the U.S. was the world's kind of model for rights and freedom. Uh, so they could inspire or teach others, but there was no good reason for the international human rights uh, framework to be applied to the United States itself, certainly not domestically. And I must say, even American activists ascribe to this. So, you know, before 9-11, the ACLU did not have a human rights program and even Human Rights Watch, you know, didn't have a huge US focus. Um, there was also this view that inherently, you know, Americans promote human rights in the world. So any kind of deployments of American power uh, were at the ends, you know, to, a means to the ends of promoting rights and freedom. And in the Middle East, Authoritarian regimes were just beginning to master the human rights game, creating also, you know, the appearances and the bells and whistles uh, and adopting the jargon of human rights in ways that were designed to have absolutely no impact. Um, at the same time, local human rights voices in the Middle East on human rights, um, you know, were really drowned out by local repression and the louder voices coming from you know, kind of uh, dominating the debate from, from abroad. So for Middle Eastern populations, human rights was experienced as simply kind of entrenching power rather than serving as, as much of an emancipatory force. So that's where we were in 2001. Um, and over the last 20 years, we have traveled quite a long <laughs> road. And I think, you know, much of it has to do with, um, you know, a lot of, uh, negative impacts from 9-11 and setbacks from 9-11 or the U.S. response to 9-11, um, but there have also been openings um, and we are in many respects in a better place today than we were in 2001. So that's uh, what I hope we can, you know, pick up from, where we can pick up from. And I will start uh, with Sarah Lee Whitson. If uh, you can, you know, start the conversation with uh, describing the impact on 9-11 on human rights activism and human rights uh, progress in the Middle East, um, you know, around the time when, when you joined uh, Human Rights Watch there. Uh, thanks, uh, Shadi. Um, I guess, um, first of all, I would say that framing uh, this as human rights progress in the Middle East would really be a misnomer. Um, because first and foremost, um, the uh, uh, fallout from 9-11 was a human rights disaster uh, for the people uh, of the region um, with the so-called preemptive war in Iraq on the pretext of uh, Al-Qaeda's links to Saddam Hussein and weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, uh, the death toll of the war, the invasion and occupation of Iraq that killed at least 500,000 Iraqis and led to the dismantling of Iraq uh, as a strong state in the Middle East. It was a disaster for the people of Afghanistan as well with the legacy of 20 years of war, um, which of course is not over yet, notwithstanding the withdrawal of US forces that are still fighting uh, uh, going on in the region. Um, I think there was uh, uh, also a de-exceptionalism of the United States as a human rights respecting law-abiding country um, rather than a knee-jerk abuser like the tyrants and thugs um, of uh, the Middle East that people were so familiar with. And I think that fundamentally changed the perception of the United States in the Middle East and North Africa in particular. It certainly exposed the vulnerability of the United States in a way that I think uh, had never been seen before, um, but also it exposed the brutality that the United States could dole out, not just in the Iraq war, um, but as you mentioned in Abu Ghraib, uh, in the renditions, in the secret detention centers, in uh, Guantanamo, uh, in the arrests of Muslims inside the United States, in drone strike executions against anyone the United States deemed uh, uh, an undesirable uh, uh, danger uh, to the United States. Uh, it also triggered copycat laws throughout the region uh, where they framed their own abusive laws 
uh, as wars on terror, uh, like America's global war on terror. So if America can have a global war on terror uh, and arrest and prosecute people based on counterterrorism laws, um, then that's what Middle East governments would do. If America would have surveillance laws that allowed the government to surveil everyone everywhere, uh, basically, uh, uh, all laws that were initiated and promoted by the United States and promoted at the UN uh, as anti-terrorism laws, as counterterrorism laws, uh, then they would also and are used in the region uh, to prosecute peaceful political activism and, and uh, expression. I think that the uh, uh, other fallout was that uh, uh, the counterterrorism framework, um, which is the lasting legacy of 9-11, uh, uh, was used to successfully woo to the United States, woo the United States into a role as a security partner against terrorism. Uh, uh, and led, for example, to decades of, of uh, uh, Ali Saleh's uh, partnership uh, uh, with the United States and Yemen, uh, building U.S. support and massive funding to fight terrorism there, um, but also in Israel, in Egypt, in Jordan, uh, just to give a few examples, which all recast their relationship uh, and their, uh, with the United States and their own dilemmas as one of fighting terrorism. Uh, to sadly uh, quite good success uh, in terms of uh, their relationships with successive American administrations. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, Nadia, I wonder if you can kind of uh, answer the same question, but in relation to women's rights. Yeah, well, as you uh, already stated, Shadi, and, and thanks for putting this panel together, women's rights or the discourse on women's rights was very central to the rhetoric of the war on terror. And uh, when I look at Iraq, I mean, a country that um, I've not only been studying, but I've been involved with feminist activists and our family there, um, the rhetoric on women's liberation and women's rights wasn't as central as it was in the case of Afghanistan. I mean, there it was clearly at the forefront, but it was part of the wider rhetoric of bringing human rights, bringing democracy, um, Aside, of course, from this tenuous link that you already mentioned in terms of the weapons of mass destruction that um, never appeared. Um, so in Iraq, um, what happened was that um, there was a great backlash against women's rights, despite the fact that there was a long history, actually, of women's rights and feminist mobilization. Yes. Of course, during the regime of Saddam Hussein, there was no independent feminist activism, but there was a wide commitment to women's education, to labor force participation, and to the inclusion of women in sort of general public life. Uh, but at the time when the, the West, particularly the US, put women's liberation at the center of their rhetoric, that created not only in Iraq, but throughout the region, a backlash against women's rights. Um, there's also a history to that. I mean, historically, feminist activists in the region have been vulnerable to being accused of mimicking the West. We know that, but it intensified greatly uh, in the context of the war on terror. And if we sort of zoom into the specific situation in Iraq, uh, yes, initially there was a mushrooming of women's rights organizations following the invasion. Uh, there was a kind of in NGOization. There was lots of money thrown at these NGOs. Uh, but this was very short lived because it, it also became obvious that as much as uh, women's rights were on top of the agenda, it was the first thing to go. It was the first thing to go when there were problems, when there was an insurgence, when there was a resistance to the military invasion. And um, none of the generals, none of the military actually cared for women's rights. <clears throat> and not only that, I mean, the US occupation actively turned a blind eye against increases of gender-based violence, especially following you know, the 2004 and 2005 uh, uh, sectarian tensions. And um, you know, when Iraqi women's rights activists would approach the occupation and ask for support, they said, well, we don't do women. I mean, there were actually a few US generals who were put on record saying this. And I remember uh, coming to the US um, following the invasion in 2006, 2007, I, you know, I came frequently and gave talks here. And often I was confronted by an audience, although critical of the US invasion, you know, they would tell me, but, um, you know, the now there are 
women's rights enshrined in the constitution and now there is a equal representation or almost equal, there's a quota in the constitution and had to remind people that any rights that Iraqi women gained following the invasion was despite the US, not because of the US. Because when Iraqi women's rights activists uh, actually approached um, then Ambassador Paul Bremer, who was the head of the coalition of provisional authority, and they requested a 40% um, representation in all sort of political leadership roles, he looked at them and he said, we don't do quotas. You know, which was really, uh, you know, quite ironic given that uh, the way that the US installed the Iraqi uh, governing council, it was all based on, on quotas, uh, sectarian ethnic quotas. But when it came to women, no, we don't do that. But Iraqi women pushed. And also I should say that was actually a positive example of also transnational mobilization because you had Iraqi women's organizations abroad working jointly with international women's organizations, working with local uh, Iraqi women's activists. And although they did not manage to get 40% enshrined in the constitution, they ended up getting 25%. Of course, we know that representation is not everything. And of course, what happened at the end is that many of the 25% ended up um, being often the wives, sisters, and daughters of conservative male politicians. Um, so, you know, this, I think, also tells us about the limitations of laws. But, I mean, overall, the war on terror, the discourse of the war on terror focusing on women's rights created a backlash against women's rights in the region. But, very importantly, that did not stop women's rights activists across the region to continue mobilizing and challenging not only U.S. policies, but also local forms of authoritarianism, militarism, and sectarianism. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so, Jamil, turning to the United States, um, although given your background, um, you know, feel free to chime in on the Middle East as well, but, you know, uh, American exceptionalism is a widely discussed phenomenon um, in human rights. Uh, and so the question for you is what was the impact of 9-11 on American exceptionalism, particularly when it came to kind of applying human rights domestically. And, you know, I have argued that, um, you know, programs like the ACLU's human rights program were kind of an outgrowth of, of some kind of a shift there. I wonder if that's your experience. Thank you, Shadi, and thanks for organizing this really important conversation. Um, I, I think that the, I just want to uh, maybe build on what uh, Sarah Lee said about the perception of the United States being a law-abiding country committed to the rule of law, to human rights, and that the perception, I think, that uh, prevailed for uh, and continues sometimes to prevail even after 9-11. But I think that perception has been uh, completely uh, you know, uh, challenged uh, after 9-11. And I think that is that it was not really that the United States has always been committed fully to, to these ideals, to these principles, to human rights, uh, whether at home, domestically or abroad. There's always been exceptions. And as you said, there's placing the United States in a position that differs from the rest of the, the world uh, and in, on different grounds. But more importantly, I think it was successful in smart, marketing the United States as uh, freedom uh, a liberating country or freedom promoting country or a champion of human rights while really not willing um, to address it at home domestically. And so I think what happened after 9-11 is that it became more the focus of the United States uh, uh, idea of the United States being a law abiding uh, country in internationally and whether that is true or, uh, and that was challenged on a number of fronts. And certainly the images of Abu Ghraib uh, torture, which were, again, by the Bush administration, we were told that these were just a, a few bad apples. And yet we were very convinced that this is a widespread uh, and it was actually a, a policy of torture and legalization of, of torture uh, that has also some um, uh, ref, uh, kind of parallels in a domestic prison system in the carceral US system, in the long history of the United States of um, leaving uh, people outside the protection of the law, criminalization of dissent, 
uh, allowing and even authorization of mass surveillance that happened in the United States, as you uh, all know from history of whether it's the uh, peaceful protest against the Vietnam War or the Black Panther or Black activist, uh, as well as democratism, et cetera. There's so the long history of that. Uh, and I think after 9-11, we see that there, there is a shift within the US of people perception of what the United States is doing around the world as well. Uh, foreign intervention not always received uh, uh, that much attention. I think the fact that there were uh, so much damage caused to that, I think they created a, a pressure on people to realize that there's no, the U.S. can't be credible anymore to be talking about human rights and freedoms and democracy well, without challenging what is happening in the United States. So we see that we have taken this mantle. We, the ACLU and many other organizations, uh, the U.S. Human Rights Network was created uh, around that time in 2003, 2004. We, there was a lot of organizations that shifted and connected more uh, between what happens in the United States and abroad. I came from uh, working on Palestinian human rights issues and I saw the parallel. Uh, I worked on issues of administrative detention, uh, indefinite detention, and issues of, of uh, the this, this, this switch or the shifting uh, and trying to twist international law in order to serve and legitimize particular policies that the Israeli government put in place, uh, whether it's in the use of uh, drone strikes, whether the use of um, uh, home demolitions, the use of deportation without due process, whether it's the use of uh, the torture and legalization of torture. And we saw how some of these arguments, some of these kinds of situations been used in order to justify uh, what the U.S. has done after 9-11. And so I think that there is a, that I thought that there was also an awakening with a silver lining for me after 9-11 was that, well, this is a good, while it was a devastation, it was a really hard moment for people. I moved to the United States nine months or 10 months after 9-11. It was really hard to be here when you see the registration program, uh, the NCS program of Middle Eastern men uh, being registered, uh, a registry that we, we now look at it back and say, oh, uh, it, was, it was a very traumatic uh, time. Uh, and, but I still thought that there was a silver lining. It was an, hopefully an awakening that we could shift that in towards making better uh, the way that we deal with human rights so that we don't continue with this hypocritic uh, um, uh, uh, analysis that human rights is only abroad and domestically we only have civil rights and civil liberties and constitutional rights and we're okay with that. I think by, and we can talk more about that. I think what contributed to the shift is really the movements, the grassroots movement and a generational shift in the way that they have perceived themselves, not only in the United States in terms of liberation movements, Black Lives Matter movement, and we talk more about it is one, but also placing uh, people in assets in the world. How do they perceive the United States role in the world, particularly around militarization, particularly around issues of foreign policy and how do we uh, see that uh, uh, see that impacting the lives of people in the United States? Great, thank you so much. Um, so, Sarah Lee, turning back to you, um, so if you think about where we are today, kind of that road traveled since two thousand and one, um, how would you describe where we are now in terms of you know? human rights uh, in the Middle East, and not necessarily human rights conditions, but some of these dynamics, such as, you know, to what extent are human rights activists now able to kind of speak for themselves or at least set the agenda compared to before? Um, give us a sense of what your experience has been. Um, I guess, you know, looking at the uh, impact and fallout uh, since 9-11 in terms of, of human rights, um, there was this very strange dichotomy uh, immediately in the wake of 9-11 uh, of the United States and President Bush pushing to promote democracy uh, with some recognition that why they, why they hate us was tied to the tyranny of governments in the Middle East. Um, so we had the United States pushing for democratization in Egypt and Palestine, for example, uh, but also in Iraq, uh, however clunkily. At the same time, as it continued to support uh, abusive governments in, in Egypt and Israel uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and you know, obviously tyrannize the, the people of Iraq with a military uh, occupation. Um, 
But when the United States didn't like the outcome of the democratization efforts the, 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 uh, in the region, um, the, the short push uh, came to an end. Uh, so when Islamists were elected uh, uh, in, in, in Gaza and by the election of Hamas in 2006, uh, when uh, Egyptian parliamentarians from the Muslim Brotherhood won over 100 seats, uh, there was a massive pullback of, by the United States. Um, and I think the message that sent to activists on the ground um, was that the US wasn't really serious uh, about human rights and democracy in the region. Um, uh, and that uh, they couldn't really rely on the United States uh, for support for democratization. Uh, I do think that the uh, uh, push uh, from the United States did force uh, uh, openings uh, that had lasting impacts. The uh, forced media and civil society liberalization in Egypt, uh, but also in Iraq, um, uh, created lasting openings. Uh, in Egypt, they became the seeds of the 2011 uprisings in Egypt because it gave civil society there the time and space to organize, uh, 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 assemble and demand compliance with the rhetoric that uh, at the time President Mubarak was spouting to satisfy the United States. Uh, and in Iraq, I think for all its ills, it remains a democracy of sorts. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that in fact, there is really no real risk that it will fall back uh, to the rule of uh, someone like Saddam Hussein. Uh, it of course may fall into a permanent state of being a failed state. Uh, and that is a dilemma that we have seen, which is the stronger the state, the more the repression, the weaker the state, the more the freedom, um, but uh, the more the risk of chaos and disaster. Um, but I think that the lasting message was that Middle East activists came to realize, uh, whether that's human rights activists or political activists, that it was up to them. And I think that went a long way to planting the seeds of what became the Arab uprisings in 2011. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Nadia, a few questions I'm gonna try and lump into one. Um, okay. So again, along the same lines, what advances mm -hmm. and, and setbacks in women's rights and gender equality materialized mm -hmm. over the last 20 years when you look back um, and you know, when you listen to the coverage of, of the, you know, U.S. pullout in Afghanistan, in what mm -hmm. ways do you see a shift in discourse on women's rights? Do you mm -hmm. see a shift in discourse mm -hmm. on women's rights? Um, and how would you really compare the past, the present, and the future of women's rights and gender equality kind of in, in, in the Middle East? I know that's a huge question okay. to take a stab at. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's a lot of questions. But actually, in three just minutes. For, yeah, yeah, for 30 seconds, I actually want to react to something that Sarah Lee said. And I mean, I generally very much agree with uh, her comments. But I guess I would challenge that many people in Iraq experience uh, the current situation as freedom. I mean, I think the the uprisings we've seen, particularly by young people, is precisely because there are all these, uh, there is authoritarianism again, militarism, it's not centralized as it was before, but there are, you know, there, there are multiple uh, forces. And so I think that um, freedom is not really, I think the sort of right right word, but I, I, I understand what you were saying, Sarah Lee, in terms of people refusing the, you know, strong, dictatorship, although, you know, there's lots of nostalgia for that now, sadly. Um, in terms of your uh, question, let me start with the second part, you know, the shift in discourse. I think the shift in discourse when we look at um, the initial, you know, war on terror rhetoric and what's happening now in terms of the U.S. withdrawing from Afghanistan is in some ways it's more honest now. In some ways, um, you know, there is no pretense that human rights and particularly, you know, women's rights are of concern. I mean, who cares? I mean, it is about uh, U.S. soldiers' lives. It's about, you know, the, the money that's being put in. But, you know, there's clearly no concern uh, for, for women. And, um, yeah, so, uh, but, you know, I think your more sort of substantial question in terms of the shifts of women's rights and, and the, the picture and the past and the present and the future, it's a very mixed picture. I mean, if you look at reports on 
uh, the status of uh, women and you know gender relations. One of the things that is stressed is that generally speaking, education there have been there has been lots of progress in relation to education. I mean, whether it's literacy, but also at higher uh, level in terms of higher education. However, you know this is very precarious. I mean, in countries where there is war and conflict, I'm thinking Syria. I'm thinking, of course, Palestine, Iraq, um, Yemen. Uh, you know, those gains are lost very easily. I mean, Iraq is, an, is a country that in 1978 actually um, won a prize from UNESCO for being the country that most rapidly raised the literacy of young girls. Now, during the sanctions periods and the wars, this is, this, these gains were all lost, right? Um, in terms of labor force participation, actually, the region has one of the lowest in terms of the official statistics, but we know that, of course, women and girls participate a lot in the informal economy. Um, there have been legal reforms in many countries, especially reforms around the personal status code, that these are the set of laws that govern marriage, divorce, inheritance, inheritance and, and child custody. Um, and also there have been reforms and sort of positive developments with respect to gender-based violence. But again, as I mentioned before, this is on paper, these are laws. Whether these are actually in, you know, implemented is a totally different story and in many situations they are not. Um, but I think it's also important to mention that despite the increase again, or the sort of rise of authoritarianism across the region and the repression of um, gender-based mobilization, it's actually feminists across the region who right now are at the forefront of not just campaigning and advocating for women's rights and you know, freedom, I mean, reproductive rights, uh, issues around sexuality, but are also at the forefront of actually challenging authoritarianism, uh, militarism and sectarianism. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, Turkey is just, you know, a, <laughs> a, a big example, but I see it across the region in Lebanon, Iraq, in Palestine, everywhere. Um, I, Personally, though, I think it's really, really important not to think of the development of women's rights in a linear fashion. Uh, and that's not just in the Middle East, but I would say elsewhere. And I, I see actually everywhere in the world, we see this polarization in terms of, you know, right wing movements and discourses and then, you know, kind of progressive ones. And of course, women, not of course, but what has become apparent is that issues around gender and sexuality are kind of the litmus test and are at the center uh, of, you know, right-wing uh, discourses. I mean, we've just seen this in the United States. I mean, uh, what has happened in Texas parallels what, what's happening, you know, in, in parts of the Middle East. So I think we really have to um, stop thinking, first of all, in a linear fashion. And we also have to stop thinking around the sort of categorization of the Middle East versus the West or the US. It's actually happening everywhere, everywhere where you have an increase of, you know, right-wing discourse and movements, women's rights, uh, the rights of, you know, people who do not fit uh, heteronormativity are under severe attack. And everywhere you also have movements and, and activists who are trying to challenge that, who are trying to resist that, and who are also putting gender and sexuality at the heart of their struggle, you know, against authoritarianism and for more democracy. Okay, great, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so Jamil, I wonder if you can talk to us a little bit about where we are today as well in terms of, you know, can we speak in terms of significantly or noticeably less American human rights exceptionalism than there was in 2001? Um, and if you can talk about maybe some specific gains um, on the domestic human rights front that, that you may have been involved in and, and seen, um, as well as kind of the limits of those gains. And then finally, um, you know, if you could link it to the social movements that you alluded to earlier that, you know, were protest movements in the United States of the post of the Trump era and, and beyond. First, uh, I think I, we should remember that the architecture of post 9-11 architecture, uh, the anti-terrorism, counter-terrorism architecture, domestically and internationally, but let's talk about domestically, it, it, by and large remains intact. Uh, the Patriot Act, 
uh, some of the mass surveillance uh, architecture or the programs, uh, despite the, some of the changes, the challenges that not really changed the, the landscape uh, as far as law and policy. Uh, in fact, it, you know, it has also impacted not only federal programs, but also state and local governments. Uh, recent reporting on how NYPD has changed since 9-11 and the way that they use counterterrorism uh, as a way, as a normal way of dealing with, uh, with crime in the city or uh, addressing criminalization uh, uh, in particular. Uh, so there's a real serious uh, problem that we're still dealing with, uh, despite some of the changes that happen in terms of rejecting some of the policies, for example, like rejecting the torture policy or ending the rendition program or uh, claiming or trying or striving to close Guantanamo. Guantanamo is still open. Indefinite detention is still there. Un unfair military commission trials are still happening at Guantanamo. And, and, and other programs like the drone strikes that we will see after Afghanistan withdrawal will be an increased uh, and expanded rather than um, uh, kind of reined in because of the way that the United States will have to deal with some uh, real threats, but maybe supposed threats that we've been always told that we need to these tools in order to uh, to counter terrorism. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind. The second thing is uh, the changes that happened in terms of the discourse on human rights, it happened notwithstanding these really challenging pressures and the, and the, and the really very organized movement that is preceded 9-11 in the United States, that is well-organized conservative ideological movement against individual rights and human rights in the United States. Uh, and we've seen that happening after 9-11 and particularly when the Obama administration tried to push ratification of a very simple, straightforward treaty on disability rights, the CRPD. And the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities was, was not going to change anything in US law, was not going to cost the US anything, but really it was just more aspirational, it was more of a declaration the US is joining international community in ratification of the treaty, and yet it failed to pass uh, the Senate. And that was because of the Tea Party uh, pushback, uh, organized way of, of falsehood about, and, and also the way that people in the United States continue to think that we don't have to pay other, uh, upper, other than lip service, we don't have to do enough to do changes to the structure as far as human rights infrastructure. So we don't have a human rights infrastructure. We don't have a national human rights institution, for example, or commission like many uh, over 120 countries around the world. We don't have state uh, uh, laws that specifically incorporate international human rights. And not only that, we have a pushback constantly against that. We all remember the, the anti-Sharia uh, law uh, that were, were introduced, right? Well, now we have, uh, recently there was a wave of the anti-BDS laws. There are all these movement against any kind of progress that can be made in terms of relation. And not only that, we see backlash in voting rights. We see backlash on, on women's rights, as Nadia mentioned, uh, not only in Texas, but in many other states. We, we see backlash on LGBT rights, while the United States is promoting LGBT rights all over the world, including, by the way, under the Trump administration, they try to promote decriminalization of, of, of LGBT. Uh, and yet, while at the same time, they were homophobic and they were blocking transgender rights progress. We see uh, uh, attacks on even protest rights where the United States was claiming that it is much better than other, co other countries in the world, where we see states introducing uh, laws that would limit the right to peaceful assembly. So there's a serious setback while at the same time, I wouldn't want to dismiss some of the progress in the discourse and the organizing, particularly around social and economic rights. Uh, if you see the way that we shifted the debate around human rights on the right to health and access to health, healthcare, uh, the, uh, uh, other, other social economic rights, particularly around water rights, around issues of um, uh, uh, in, uh, education and, and uh, looking at systemic racism more broadly. That is, I think, most importantly, in recent development, where I think we were able to, because of the, the movement for Black Lives, because of people protesting over the past year or, or more, I think we saw that the government is, is now shifting even its rhetoric Internationally, they're saying we're committed to racial justice at home and abroad. Uh, we are committed to fighting systemic racism. We moved from the Trump administration denying that there was systemic racism in policing in the United States to Biden administration saying, no, we do have a problem with racism and we're going to fight it at home and abroad. And yet, again, 
the, uh, the, the challenge will be to what extent that will really change structures, that will change really transformative. Mm -hmm. To what extent will we will see people be able to realize their rights, not just because of, of the old infrastructure of civil rights laws that are under attack and challenged, look at the voting rights, but really seeing the, uh, the, the US taking serious efforts. And that will take more time. I don't think we, we were able to crack maybe holes in the US exceptionalism over the last 20 years you know, on a different level. But I don't think we'll be able to make that shift as long as we don't have that, uh, the, as long as we don't maintain the momentum with generational shift, the discourse and organizing, uh, and, and a way that we were able to bring it to not only to discourse and, and organizing, but to policy and law. And right now, there is a huge gap, and the U.S. can easily say we're doing things better than most of the world because the bar is so low. Uh, just I just will leave you with this idea that every time member, members of the administration talk about the U.S., they open with these talking points. We have an independent judiciary. We have a rule of law. We have a vibrant civil society. People can challenge the government freely without you know, the fear of being prosecuted. But this is a very low bar if you think about it, right? That that's what they say to the world, that that's what we do. And we think that this is the time to look at what is the gap. And I, I feel very encouraged by the fact for the, for example, the reparations movement in the United States is getting uh, uh, more and more traction. There's more support for it because it opens the, the root cause of the issue. That's what we try, we were able and successful in getting the George Floyd UN resolution, creating a an, an mechanism that while not exclusively focusing on the United States, I think it will really spend a lot of its time on the US looking at the root causes of systemic racism from slavery, from transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade to colonialism, linking struggles between what happened in the United States over the decades and centuries to what happened in other countries, including in the Middle East. I think that is an, an opening that Black Lives Matter gave us uh, opportunity to connect transnationally with other movements. We've seen that from Brazil uh, to Colombia, to United States, to Europe, to the Middle East, to Palestine, and other parts of North Africa, thinking about how that could be challenging militarization, challenging the, the authoritarian state, even if it's sometimes called a democracy, but it still has authoritarian approaches and policies. Thank you so much. You got a lot in there in, in that answer. Thank you for that very substantive answer. I do want to try and get to you know the question and answers relatively close to the 1045 we promised. Uh, but I, I, I have to get in at least uh, the last questions for um, Nadia and, and Sarah Lee uh, that I had planned. So Sarah Lee, very simply, you know, obviously a very difficult question, much more difficult than it seems question to answer what should the U.S.'s role be vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East when it comes to human rights? And let me just throw out Nadia's uh, question as well so that we can go straight to her. Um, so Nadia, you know, much needed uh, discussions of, you know, anti-imperialism, decolonizing, um, you know, even the human rights field and, and, and a lot of these conversations in American universities and, and activism that's spurring from, from the United States in particular. Um, but you, I recently heard you reference how sometimes that discourse is, is maybe, you know, at a different space than where the activists on the ground in places like Iraq might be and, and how sometimes they feel undermined by, by um, you know, the politics that's being promoted in, in, in the Western context, albeit, you know, in very progressive and well-intentioned well ways. So I was hoping that you could kind of dig a little deeper into that, because I think that's a really important point um, that should not be left unsaid. Okay, Sarah Lee, please. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a very minimalist uh, uh, demand or recommendation to the United States in terms of human rights in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, but I think given the way the US uh, policy is structured, it ends up sounding quite maximalist uh, in that I think first and foremost, the United States should end its harm to the people of the region. Uh, just stop um, what it's doing, uh, stop supporting abusive, apartheid, unelected, unrepresentative uh, governments in the region. I think Americans have to come to terms um, with the fact uh, 
um, that our government is contributing to human rights harms uh, in the region, not promoting democracy and human rights, uh, but supporting uh, the abusers of human rights in providing military, political, and economic support uh, to the governments of Egypt uh, and Israel and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, uh, just to name a few examples. If the US did nothing more than just stop supporting these governments, that would be a great contribution uh, to the people of the Middle East. If rather than people advocating uh, and pushing the United States to start a new war, uh, for example, to save the children of Syria, uh, uh, they should just stop uh, bombing the children of Yemen and Palestine. Uh, I think that the United States deeply, deeply uh, is in need of some humility uh, in disabusing ourselves of the notion that the United States can or should uh, or seeks to promote human rights in the region. Now, I don't think it's the responsibility of the US government to fix uh, the Middle East, but it is our responsibility to stop hurting the people uh, of the Middle East. And that would require ending America's military domination, uh, efforts to control and militarily intervene in the Middle East, uh, either directly or through its proxy uh, agents. Uh, I think that would uh, cause a dramatic shift uh, in America's human rights portfolio in the region. Okay, well, I'll um, continue here. Uh, thanks, uh, Sarah Lee. Yeah, um, well, over the years working, having worked as an academic, but also having been involved in various uh, feminist activist organizations in the Middle East and the diaspora, I've been aware of some of the tensions, <clears throat> excuse me, and the tensions are particularly linked to, I think, academics based in the US, a little bit more so than in Europe. And I understand it, especially now having moved to the US, that I feel, of course, like everyone else here, like a big chunk of my political responsibility is to challenge US imperialism, is to challenge racism, is to challenge Islamophobia. No doubt about that. But I think we have to be very careful, those of us who are based in the US, that while we do that, we don't end up undermining activists in the region who, while clearly being critical of US imperialism, have many other struggles against many other actors, regional, national, local actors. So if I come and say, oh, you know, we shouldn't speak about, you know, corrupt politicians, uh, you know, like, or authoritarianism and militarism in Iraq or sectarian violence, or we can, it's all US imperialism, that ends up being a problem, you know, for local activists, because, while clearly there are links and clearly, um, as uh, you know, Sara Lee and Jamil rightly pointed out, I mean, the, uh, the West, especially US, has been propping up and supporting uh, authoritarian leaders, but we can't reduce them to the US. I mean, they're agents in and of themselves. And of course, also, I understand that us, uh, those of us based in Western context, we want to challenge these very stereotypical and orient orientalist ideas of their culture, their culture that is backward, you know, their culture that's responsible for oppressing women. But if we say that culture doesn't matter, again, we are risking undermining, you know, those activists, especially feminist and queer activists, to saying, well, we have a problem with, you know, conservative culture in the way, of course, culture is always contested, but the way that, you know, certain uh, ideas around gender relations, gender norms and sexuality are interpreted and are being practiced. Clearly culture matters. Clearly, you know, uh, they're fighting, um, uh, you know, local actors such as militia, uh, conservative religious authorities, uh, family dynamics. Um, and unfortunately, I see that sometimes, you know, uh, colleagues who are sort of based in, in the US, I mean, speaking of humility, I think we all need a good dose of humility. And I think it's also really important to um, be reflective of our respective positionalities. That does not mean that we should stop criticizing, challenging, and you know, trying to find alternative, alternatives to US policies and of course challenge Islamophobia and racism, but not you know, in that process as it sometimes happens. Um, undermining activists. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that very important point. 
Um, all right, so uh, Jamil, the, the qu last question I had for you was to kind of reflect on what you think might be the future of, of human rights um, in the US context. Uh, but let me also kind of incorporate that into our Q&A um, session. And right now I only see one question. So uh, the audience, please feel free to submit more. Uh, but the one question that we have revolves around climate change, which is a topic that is you know, increasingly <laughs> has human rights implications and is being discussed through the human rights framework. And obviously, I think we can all agree, has caused and will continue to cause great human suffering that is, you know, of concern to the human rights project. So I think that's a very interesting point to throw into the mix here. Um, I don't know how we can link it to 9-11, but I'm sure if we tried, we could. Uh, so if but, anyone wants to take a stab at that, but Jamil, do you want to start us off with, with kind of how you see the future of the U.S., of human rights and American exceptionalism and, and these movements in the U.S. that have started? Absolutely. So I think first is, the, again, alluding to, I alluded to the generational shift and the also demographic shift in the United States. These are going to be really uh, key in changing not only discourse, but also action towards uh, structural changes. Uh, I think the the intersectional approaches to the rights, uh, the struggle for human rights is, is a imperative and continuing to do that. So it's not going to be siloed movements, you know, and that's been the case in the United States for a long time. And I think that we're seeing much more coordination, much more a lot uh, aligned uh, struggles between immigrants' rights movement, women's rights movement, and uh, racial justice movement, and environmental justice movement, and indigenous rights movement, which is actually after the Dakota uh, um, Access Pipeline resistance, or the, uh, the, we have really, uh, for the first time, saw how indigenous peoples can lead uh, towards look, telling the world that there is a problem and we, we may have some good solutions. Uh, and really uh, brought uh, very diverse uh, global movement uh, to support the connection between climate justice and uh, water rights or uh, fundamental environmental justice, as well as indigenous rights. Uh, and I think those connections are going to become more and more uh, clear and um, hard to ignore. The, the only only thing that I would say about I'm not a climate uh, expert and I certainly don't know enough about it in the Middle East to say it, but I do think that one thing that could be uh, a connection to post 9-11 or the 20th anniversary of 9-11 is that the way that we shifted resources after 9-11 and diverted attention from uh, global uh, threats uh, to domestic issues as well, to this fight against terrorism and the way that uh, foreign interventions, you know, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, the so-called war on terror, and how much money and the military industrial complex have been really boosted by the war on terror. If we think about it, think about how much we could have done more in order to address this scourge of systemic racism, the issues of environmental justice and climate justice, if we were able to focus on these threats. And there is a connection between also, as, as some experts alluded to climate crisis and refugee crisis and migration crisis. If we, have, if we are able to shift resources and put them in the right place, that we, what are the root causes of these issues? What, how do we address them? And, and finally, I would just want to say something to what Sari, I agree with Sari with, about that the U.S. should get out of the way and not interfere, not to support Middle East regimes that violate human rights. But I think the United States owes the people of the Middle East also uh, reparations uh, for the damage that was being caused. Uh, so it's not just, okay, we're going to pull out and see you, um, you know, uh, at the next international uh, meeting where we're going to, we, there is com some, some really good case to be made that the United States has to, has commitments. And the question is how to do that without doing the same mistakes all over again, which is to tie this kind of uh, its own responsibility, just like former colonial powers towards Africa, towards other nations, to uh, their own self-interest, rather than seeing the global good, rather than seeing and centering the peoples who are directly harmed and impacted by these foreign interventions and milit militarization and wars. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so Nadia and Sierra Lee, if you want to comment on, on the climate change question, um, and also, um, 
Well, let me see. There's one more question. Let me see if we can add that yeah. in here. Um, <coughs> So in what way should we be promoting a change of our views in the direction to respect others in all areas rather than promoting one set of beliefs? In what ways are we promoting respect for other views and culture? Um, and this is in the context of, of human rights. So I'm assuming this is a question that kind of is tied up with the whole cultural relativism mm -hmm. and universalism mm -hmm. debate that mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. you know, been there from the inception of the human rights project. Um, and I certainly could say <laughs> a lot about this myself, um, but I will uh, turn it over to you um, just by way of making this kind of concluding comments uh, from, from each of you, and particularly Sarah Lee and Nadia. Um, Sarah Lee, if you could say a little bit more about headway that you think you may have made on the arms sales track, which I think Dawn is, is quite active on. Um, and Nadia, a question that is not fair and impossible to answer, but I will throw it out there anyways. Uh, in terms of human rights, social, you know, women's rights, human rights, all of, of these kind of values that, that we care about, is Iraq better off with or, you know, with, with, with or without the U.S. intervention um, in the long term? I know you can't answer that, but... I'm throwing it out anyway. <laughs> um, okay, Let's see what what you have for us. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Nadia, do you want to go first? Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, 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 no. Go I, ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, I guess uh, I would say that uh, curbing uh, U.S. arms sales uh, and arms gifts uh, to the abusive apartheid authoritarian regimes of the Middle East. Uh, is definitely uh, uh, our top priority uh, at dawn, and I think should be the top human rights priority for everyone, um, whether you're a feminist as I am, uh, or whether you uh, are not a feminist, whatever you are, um, because whoever's rights you're talking about, uh, they are being trampled uh, by outright murder. Uh, uh, by bombardment, uh, by uh, mass uh, uh, massacres, uh, uh, mass detentions, uh, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands incarcerated, including uh, uh, men and women, uh, including children. Um, and uh, I just want to uh, also distinguish and make clear that prioritizing ending America's harmful uh, role in the Middle East and North Africa as a top human rights priority, as a top responsibility, uh, 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 in no way means contesting or challenging uh, the right of women, the right of LGBT communities, uh, uh, the right of minority communities in the Middle East and North Africa to fully demand their freedom and their rights and to make clear that we fully support their struggle for freedom uh, and equality uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. I don't think these are mutually inconsistent things. Uh, I think where we see, uh, and this is really responding to Nadia more than anything, some confusion in the discourse is when activists, not just in the Middle East, uh, 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 and, and increasingly, we are a global activist community um, with, with, you know, with, with mixed identities uh, and mixed races. Uh, when they continue to turn to the United States government as a savior, as the entity that will bring uh, women's rights, that will bring LGBT rights, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think that ultimately uh, can damage and undermine the local struggles. Um, we need to support them and we need to back them, um, but we cannot uh, turn to America's barrel of the gun uh, to achieve those goals. Great, thank you so much, and Nadia. Yeah, actually I saw there are a few more questions and I actually I'd like to try to address uh, yeah. Emily's question around, you know, how should we uh, promote change um, while respecting others uh, and other set of beliefs? And then an anonymous attend attendee asks, you know, how are we able to come to terms with personal feelings on feminism and LGBTQ rights and respecting the culture in place? And I think, um, you know, these of course are uh, questions that come up all the time. And I think we really need to stop thinking in um, those uh, binaries in terms of, you know, so Western culture is promoting feminism and LGBTQ rights and Middle Eastern culture is opposed to that and so we can't go there. I mean, the, the point is that in 
all contexts, these are contested ideas. And, you know, as we've just mentioned before, I mean, in the US, we cannot speak about, you know, US promoting feminism and LGBTQ rights. I mean, some people do, but many don't. And the same in the Middle East. And, you know, there are, of course, LGBTQ activists, feminist activists in the region who, yes, I mean, they might have to, you know, in terms of their language, have to be sensitive to prevailing cultural norms, but they they are involved in the process, in the internal pro uh, process of contesting culture, of challenging prevailing cultural norms. So, you know, I, th I think it's really about time that we uh, both de-exceptionalize the US, the Middle East, and rethink our categories. Uh, and particularly when it comes to LGBTQ activism, I mean, I've been sort of writing about that in the context, I'm thinking about that in the context of Lebanon. Yeah, they're actually, in many ways, LGBTQ activists are challenging sort of binaries in terms of being out and proud and being in the closet and, you know, finding ways of you know, not hiding themselves, but not necessarily being involved in identity politics and also being very intersectional in their struggle. So if you're an LGBTQ activist in Lebanon, you're still uh, also interested in domestic migrant workers' rights, in the rights of Syrian refugees in Palestine and so on. So intersectionality is really important in that context. And then finally, to your impossible question, well, um, it is impossible. I, I mean, I guess for me, the sad thing is that um, if you, different, um, different Iraqis would tell you different stories, depending on how they were positioned during the Ba'ath regime. You know, if you were part of, uh, you know, um, sort of middle class, you know, whatever your ethnic and sectarian background, and you were able to live a quite comfortable life economically, you were able to send your children to education, you kept your head down politically, you could get by. Uh, and, you know, those people, uh, you know, will say that um, they're missing the days of Saddam, sadly, right? But there are lots of people who say no, I mean, they wouldn't want to go back. And, you know, despite, you know, all the, uh, the chaos and the violence in the post-invasion period, that is better than, you know, than Saddam Hussein. So I think it's really important to realize that people had very different experiences during the Saddam regime. And yes, of course, it had something to do with their ethnic and religious background, but it also had something to do with their class background, with their specific, uh, you know, political also uh, orientation. Um, I don't uh, want to make that judgment. I, I think it's a mixed bag. And I don't think that people should have to choose between, you know, Saddam Hussein and then, you know, this uh, current uh, chaos and um, actually also return back to authoritarianism and militarism. Thank you. Thank you so much to all three of you for, for such a, a rich discussion. Um, and I wish we could make this an all day. <laughs> I think there's so much to say here. There's so many layers. So um, again, thank you. Thank you for your time and sharing your experiences in this way. Thank you to the audience. And I think we have, I have kept this all more or less on time. Um, there is another event uh, I, I should remind you about coming up. Uh, so the next SIS event, uh, 20, uh, 20 years after 9-11, is taking place Tuesday, September 14th, uh, with Professor Josh Rogner, uh, who will moderate a panel discussion on U.S. domestic response, the U.S. domestic response to 9-11, um, and its continued impacts today. So. Uh, I hope that you can join us uh, for that event as well.